welcome to this video today we talk about history social science for class 7 emergence of kingdoms in south india emergence of kingdoms in south india medieval history 700 to 1750 later cholas cholas were a very prominent dynasty of the south because of hundreds of reasons cholas were a very prominent dynasty of south because of hundreds of reasons now they had a elaborate state structure they had a administrative setup they had an irrigation network they built a lot number of temples their palaces were great and they made great contributions to art architecture and they also were known for overseas exploits these are in summary the reasons for the prominence or greatness of the cholas in the south now cholas were mostly based around the kaveri delta from geography you know what is the delta the area where the distributaries of the kaveri river bring and deposit their silt and sediments and make it very fertile for agricultural purposes now there was a place called urayur near tiruchirappalli trichy today so near that urayur there was a person who was a small governor and he started the taking over of the kingdom and built the chola empire from there later they transferred their capital to Tanjavur or Tanjore in 9th century. Kairigalan was the most famous Chola of that period. C-H-O-L-A is what we write in English but we pronounce as C-H-O-Z-H-A Chola. Kairigala Cholan. So Vijayalaya was the one who created Tanjavur as the capital and then he was succeeded by Rajendra I. Rajaraja I was famous because <coughs> he built the Rajarajeshwaram which is today known as the Birgadishwara temple and its precincts. Rajaraja was also famous. Rajaraja was Rajendra's son. He was also famous for the naval expeditions. His army had gone up to Sumatra, up to Indonesia, up to Sri Lanka and all. They also went to the up to, they also had their campaigns up to the west coast. Rajaraja won. Then came Rajendra. Rajendra Chola he ruled from 1016 to 1044. So Rajendra Chola was popular because he went up to Indo-Gangetic plain. So that is why he came back and built a city called Gangai Konda Cholapuram. Gangai Konda Cholapuram is a city formed to commemorate the victory up to Ganges by a Chola king, Rajendra Chola. So Rajaraja is known for his naval expeditions and expanding the kingdom and having relationships till the west coast to Sri Lanka. Rajaraja was also known for having built the Brihadishwara temple or Rajarajeshwaram. Rajendra Chola had built the Gangai Konda Cholapuram. Now Rajendra Chola also had relationships with Sri Vijaya kingdom of the Sumatra. Sri Vijaya kingdom of the Sumatra had also roots to the Indian lineage and they were in the nation region. So these are in summary about the Cholas. Now, fall of the Cholas. What happened is after three successors, the Chola rule ended as Vijay Rajendra's son Adi Rajendra was killed in a civil unrest. Vijay Rajendra's son Adi Rajendra was killed in a civil unrest. So, we know Karigala established and then Vijay Lava created the Janjavur temple and then you have Rajendra and Rajaraja. Then, Vijay Rajendra's son Adi Rajendra was killed in a civil unrest. Okay. Now, Rajaraja. There was a matrimonial alliances between the Chalukya kings. Chalukya were somewhere and maybe we can say today's Andhra Pradesh. Rajaraja one's daughter Kundavai was married to Chalukya king Vimaladitya. Rajaraja one's daughter Kundavai was married to Chalukya prince Vimaladitya. And their son was Rajaraja Narendra. Their son was Rajaraja Narendra. He was married to daughter of Rajendra Chola named Amanga Devi and they had a son called Kulotunga I. So because Kundavai was married of the Chalukya prince Vimaladitya and their son Rajaraja Narendra was a Chalukya prince. He married a Chalukya, Rajendra Chola's daughter Amanga Devi and had a son called Kulotunga. Kulotunga was a Chalukya prince. Now because after Veera Rajendra, Adi Rajendra came into power. He was killed in a civil unrest. Kulotunga take over the reins of the Cholas. Rajendra Chalukya seized the Chola throne. 
കുലോത്തുങ്ക രാജേന്ദ്ര ചോള രാജേന്ദ്ര ചാലുക്യ ചീസ്ഡ് ചോള ത്രോൺ ആൻഡ് ബിഗാൻ ദ റൂൾ ഓഫ് ചാലുക്യ ചോള ഡയനാസ്റ്റി ആസ് കുലോത്തുങ്ക വൺ സോ ദിസ് ഗായ് ദി രാജേന്ദ്ര ചോള എന്ന മംഗദേവീസ് സൺ വാസ് കോൾഡ് രാജേന്ദ്ര ചാലുക്യ ബട്ട് ഹി ഗോട്ട് ഹിംസെൽഫ് നെയിംഡ് ആസ് കുലോത്തുങ്ക ആൻഡ് ഹി സ്റ്റാർട്ടഡ് റൂളിംഗ് ദി ചോള ചാലുക്യ ഡയനാസ്റ്റി what is a good thing about it it avoided unnecessary wars between the chalukya and chola kingdom because of the matrimonial alliances it had good will because you were able to give your daughter or take their daughter as in the matrimonial alliances but then subsequently they lost sri lanka the pandian kingdom also slipped out kanjipuram was lost to the telugu cholas so kanjipuram in the northeast was lost on the south the pandian kingdom was lost sri lanka was also went out of the control of the chola kingdom this is what caused the fall of cholas though the chola chalukya dynasty kulothunga tried to take control of the chola and revive them in 1279 maravarman kulashegara pandian kulashegara pandian 1 defeated the last king of the chola chalukya dynasty who was called rajendra choya 3 so you had rajendra and rajaraja and they were called rajendra chola 1 rajendra chola 2 and then finally rajendra chola 3 was defeated by kulasegara pandian 1 in 1279 so we can say by around 1279 chola dynasty lost its significance to a large extent but chola dynasty or chola administration was popular for hundreds of reasons we know they are popular for extensive irrigation network vast number of temples contribution to art and architecture overseas exploits state structure what is a state structure as the head of the state the king enjoyed enormous powers orders were written down in palm leaves or inscribed on the temple walls so temples were the center of activity for the culture people used to come there and they came to know about the orders by reading the inscriptions on the walls which meant people were knowing how to read and how to write the kingship was hereditary that means what the king inherited the kingdom that means what the eldest son will become the heir apparent this was the culture there kingship was hereditary eldest son became the heir apparent and the king inherited the kingdom yuvarajas were appointed as governors for administrative training yuvarajas were appointed as governors for administrative training and for administrative convenience the kingdom was divided into provinces it was called mandalam kingdom was divided into mandalams and there were subdivided into nadus that is why even today you have places like kungnadu etc right and then they were subdivided into villages groups of village called kurram so you had a kingdom below that you had mandalams below that you had nadu below that you have kurram and below that you have the gramam gramam is the village kurram is a group of village nadu is a portion of the mandalam while mandalam is the province right this is how the administrative division was there in the country for the sake of convenience how is local administration happening the urar the sabayar the nagarathar and the natar are the people who were taking care of the local administration urar sabayar nagarathar natar who are nurars urar are the people who belong to the ur they are the landowners of the village urar are the people who belong to the ur ur is a village and they are the landholders landowners the peasants the agriculturalists now numerous peasant settlement came up on the countryside that is called ur the settlements of the farmers settlement of the peasants on the countryside is called a ur the landholders acted as a spokesman for the ur the, they are called the urar the people of the ur are called urar now sabayar people of the sabai is called sabayar who are the sabai people of the sabai brahman villages had a saba brahmins were given land by the king so that they can take care of their vedic ritual activities and lead the cultural rituals in the temples so these brahman villages because brahmins most of them were active in vedic rituals or the temple formalities they appointed a sabha to take care of the administration of their land of their villages from irrigation to digging out the canals to collecting the revenue to distributing the rewards to paying the taxes everything the sabha used to take care the sabha is a council of members and these members were called sabayar so members of the sabai sabai are members of those who are so they carried out judicial and financial functions now how somebody will be elected to sabha that is given in detail in the uttiramerur inscription now what is nagarathar nagarathar are the people of the nagaram 
people of the nagaram or called nagarata what is nagaram nagaram is a place where the traders settled so we know there are multiple types of production primary production where you harvest the gifts of the earth mother earth and then secondary production where you for example convert the wheat into flour and then you have a tertiary production where you add value to it to make it presentable to the consumer so this we you know so now nagaratar is the place where the traders and others are settled it is it was not the main place of the peasants it was a main place of the traders is nagaratar people who settled in the nagaram were called the nagaratar and the prominent citizens of the trader settlement were the nagaratar who administered the nagaram then you have the nata nata or the nobles of the nadu nadu is a subdivision of the mandalam and a bigger group of kurams is a nadu so people who were the nobles of the nadu is called nata nata they are the assembly and they took care of dispute settlement and other allied activities now there were various other skilled artisans other than the traders and other than the peasants there were other people like the masons the blacksmith the goldsmith the weaver the potter they settled around the nagaram they settled around the nagaram so this is the simple ways the chola administration how the state was divided and how the state was governed now what is special about the uttiramerur inscription uttiramerur inscription says how members were elected to the committees of the village uttiramerur inscription talks about how members were elected to the committees of the village one member was to be elected from each ward so within the village within the ur within the settlement there were wards one member will be elected from each ward there were around 30 wards in total as per the uttiramerur inscription for that place the eligibility to contest was it they should be men not women and they should be in the age group of 35 to 70 not very old or not very young why at least 35 they should have a reasonable experience of life what else they should know they should be well versed in vedic text and scriptures that means they should be educated they should be at least of 30 years age only one member for every ward will be elected and they should own the land and house why they should own the land and house only as a owner of the land you will know the problems of the peasants only if you own a house you will have no further need for accumulating money but having a house is considered to be reasonably economically well off so the economic and social background owner of the land owner of a house educational background some studies civic background you should be at least 35 years of age the only then you can try to become a member of the council or committee that will decide the fate of the village so this is how the members were elected to the committees of the village says the uttiramerur inscription now what is the process of the election the names of qualified candidates like this who are willing to become members of the committee were written on a palm leaf slip and it was put in a pot so we know there were potters we know how people were knowing how to make pots we know how people know knew how to write on a palm leaf so in that time paper was not there people were not writing permanently in a copper plate why not permanently in a copper plate because this was a temporary use so they were written a palm slip and put in a pot the eldest of the assembly will engage a young boy eldest of the assembly because he will have all the experience of how the village had worked all these days and the young boy because he will not have any bias will be asked to pull out one slip and declare his name this is how we do the lucky dip today also so that name will come and the name will be declared and that guy will be selected as a member of the ward for that committee of the village like this various committees were decided this is what we learn from uttiramerur description this is why we say from the inscrip- inscriptions from the manuscripts from the inscriptions on the walls or the uh, temples or the palaces or the stupas we come to learn about history of the past medieval history we are able to learn in this fashion now what is the revenue administration of the chola period the land was a main source of revenue land tax was called as kani kadan land tax was called as kani kadan the word kani also has a meaning as land kani kadan elaborate survey of the land was done to find out how much agricultural produce could come from there is it irrigated and things like that and then government fixed their share of the revenue not all land was equally taxed and tax was fixed based on the survey of the land and that is how the kani kadan or the tax was fixed one third of the produce was usually collected as a tax one third of the produce so the tax was not based on any type of land any tax but it was 
based on the produce if it is a very fertile land you pay more tax if it is a dry land you produce less tax mostly tax was collected in kind that means what you will give the grain to the granary of the kingdom there were taxes on the profession also and the tolls were there on the trade also tolls were there on the trade also from the inscriptions we also come to know that there were taxes if you build a hard roof house that means a four mud walled house will have a different tax from a house that has a thatched roof so that is how it was kappam was a tax collected on the trade and profession while kani kadan was the tax collected on the produce of the land based on the survey conducted and approximately one third was collected what's the social structure the rulers gifted the land to the royal officials that means what naturally all land belonged to the king and kingdom and then land was given back to people in different forms for different purposes the land was gifted to the royal officials to the brahmins and to the temples the land given to temple or religious institution is called devadanam what does this devadanam do a lot of land was given to the temple the temple used to give this land to the landless laborers for cultivating for agricultural purposes these peasants will produce and many temples were exempted from tax so the produce from the tax is not used to pay tax to the government that is the one third produce but it will be used for running the temple affairs and to helping the people around and then some salary or some income or some revenue sharing will also happen with the people who tilled the soil then there was a land called pallichandanam pallichandam is a land given to jain institutions jain temples and jain religious institutions velan vage is a type of land what is velan vage velan vage is a type of land given to people called velalar velalar is the peasant agriculturalist land owner who who had rights over the velan vage land velan is agriculture velan vage is meant for velan mai meant for agriculture so the peasant agriculturalists the velalars used to hold the velan vage then there was a type of people called ulukudi ulukudi type of people is a subsection of the velalar they are peasants they are agriculturalists but they don't work on their own land because they don't own land they could not own the land but they will have to work on other lands what type of land maybe devadana lands or maybe pallichandam lands or on the brahmadeya lands brahmadeya is the land given to brahmins devadana is the land given to temples pallichandam is the land given to jain institutions while velan vage will be given to velalars ulukudi will be working on these other lands okay so they were called kijvaram they were called kijvaram the lower share while they were another called melvaram melvaram is the land held by velan vage people have velan velalars the holders of the velan vage are called velalars and they were called melvaram they have a major share of the harvest ulukudi will have a kijvaram or a lower share of the harvest for the work that they do on their land why velan vage land holders and velalars will have melvaram because they also own the land and they have to take care of the irrigation and other requirements the ulukudi will get the kijvaram or lower share because they only invest their labor to cultivate the brahmadeya or devadana or pallichandam or even velan vage lands then there were some people who were called adimai adimai means a slave what they do and they were also called panisai makkal what is panisai makkal people who do the work is panisai makkal laborers panisai makkal is laborers or adimai slaves they occupied the lowest strata in the society and they were held, they were little below considered little below the kijvaram types or the ulukudis also in between we had the soldiers and traders this were the way in which the society was divided social strata or social structure okay coming up to irrigation there was a 16 mile long embankment built by rajendra chola in gangai chonda cholapuram so such a long embankment itself tells us the stories about the engineering capabilities the labor the management the design the ability to bring different inputs to build that embankment at this place so how administrative capabilities the chola kings had in those days now we have something called vadi vaikal vadi vaikal is a criss cross channel a traditional type for harnessing the rain water in the kaveri delta 
during the floods and then using it in the season of non flood what is vadi vaikal vadi vaikal will take the excess flood water during the rainy season then we had vaikal vadi vaikal the vadi vaikal will drain and the vaikal will be a trench or outlet through the vaikals the river the water will flow during the non rainy season for everywhere for cultivation so this vadi and vaikal together is a criss cross channel for harvest harnessing the rain water as well as the flood water in the kaveri delta region and because of this vadi vaikal structure only they were able to have a better irrigational produce then you had something called ur vaikal ur vaikal is the vaikal owned by the ur by the village the settlement and it was dug by those peoples to facilitate agriculture within that village there was a turn system to distribute water so that everybody will get water and most of the irrigation works were the responsibility of the local bodies and so many nobles who had lost a lot of money also engaged in philanthropic activity in digging the tanks and the vaikals now eulers were ardent saivites the rulers were ardent saivites chola rulers were saivites saivites are saivism is a branch of hinduism saivite ruler or saiv vaishnavism and saivism so saivites will be followers of shiva while vaishnavites will be followers of vishnu so nine mars nine mars are the set of poets who wrote praises of shiva alvars are a set of poets who wrote the praises of vishnu so hymns composed by shiva saint called nine mars were promoted or encouraged or patronized by the chola rulers now there was a person called nambi andar nambi this nambi andar nambi codified the writings of the nine mars into tiru marai tiru marai tiru is special and exalted marai is vedic so tiru marai is a sort of special top class veda and name given to a set of writings by the nine mars who were patronized by the uh, rulers and these nine mars are saiva saints they were saints and they were followers of shiva so nambi and our nambi codified them as tirumarai many temples were built and many gifts were given to the religious institution religion was promoted during the chola times temples were not merely places of worship they were the largest land owners they were rich they had lot of wealth they use the wealth for the charity they give employment to the priests to the, the, the people who prayed the people who had the dance drama music and drums and all instruments for the temple rituals many brahmins were also employed by the temples they promoted education and devotional forms of arts such as bharatanatyam etc right the staff of the temple include the temple officials the dancing girls musicians singers players of the music instrument the priests they settled in and around the temple that is called the precincts they settled in and around the temple they lived around the temple so there was a culture there was an economy around the temple traders also settled around the temple temples in tanjavur gangai konda cholapuram daraswaram and are all repositories of architectural excellence the state of the sculpture how beautifully they were able to sculpt the idols the paintings and the iconography so the temples of the chola period are evidences of the architecture sculpture paintings and iconography of those times and gangai konda cholapuram or the bhairadeeshwara in temple are the examples of that the chola rulers were patterns of learning how do we know rajendra 1 established a vedic village where at ennayiram in vilupuram district so rajendra 1 established a vedic village what do we know from the inscriptions around 340 students were studying vedas grammar upanishad and there were 14 teachers in the ennayiram vilupuram vedic college now because this college became popular and famous subsequently colleges were established vedic colleges were established in 1048 and 1067 after a few years in tirubuvanai and tirumukkudal tirubuvanai and tirumukkudal the tiru used in tamil is somewhat similar to the sri used in northern india it is a special or exalted respect given to a place or a person is a tirubuvanai and tirumukkudal tiru also has a meaning as wealth 
Now, because there were patterns of learning, what happened? Great literary works came up. And then Periya Puranam was written during this time. Kambara Mayanam was written during this time. And as we have seen, the Nayan Mars. The Nayan Mars wrote the hymns in praise of Lord Shiva and it was codified as Tirumarai by Tirumarai by Nambi Andar Nambi. Nambi Andar Nambi. Now, regarding trade, flourishing trade brought lot of revenue to the state. Why? Because when there is a trade, there was a tax. Kappam was there, the tax paid by the traders to the government. There was guild like groups, different type of traders had different guilds, groups, whatever. One is called Anju Varnattar. Varnam is color. Anju Varnattar was one guild. What were they? They were the West Asians, Arabs, Jews, Christians, Muslims. West Asians, Arabs, Jews, Christians, Muslims, all the traders from these countries were called Anju Vannattar. They were maritime traders who settled on the port towns. Mostly they were on the west coast. So that means what? They were part of the Chera clans. Right? They were on the west coast. Anju Vannattar. West Asians, Arabs, Jews, Christians and Muslims. Then you have Mani Gramattar. What is Mani Gramattar? Mani Gramathar were the traders engaged in inland trade. Anju Vannathar were maritime traders. Sea trade, overseas trade, cross country trade, international trade was done by Anju Vannathar. Domestic trade, inland trade, within the kingdom trade was done by Mani Gramathar. So these were the two guild like groups. Now, in after a due course of time, these two groups merged under the banner of Ainutruvar. They merged into the grammar of Ainutruvar and the head of the guild was Ayavol in Karnataka. So, these merged into a single group. Because traders started doing both types of trade, they, the guilds merged into Ainutruvar. Overseas trade was popular during Chola time. Elephant tusk, corals, transparent glass, beetle nut, cardamom, opaque glass, cotton stuff, colored silk, etc. were imported. Elephant to horses were imported. Now, export was also happening. What is export happening? Export was happening on sandalwood, ebony, condiments, precious gems, pepper, oil, paddy, grains, salt, etc. were exported. That is because of the um, um, condiments and pepper, etc. only, we became to be known for the spices. Sandalwood today in the Karnataka area. The precious gems and pearls because in Tutukudi we had a gem fishing industry. So we were able to export this. So Manigramathar and Anjumannathar were doing international trade or domestic trade and they got merged together and all sorts of export and import was happening. Most of the Chola ports were on the west side. Now Pandyas. Pandyas were famous for two, three reasons of which one important thing is they had the Kayal port which is today in Chutukurin. The Kail port, not only was that the Kail port was important from the trade perspective, in the Kail port, people were able to do a pearl fishing also. Pandyas were one of the three ancient Tamil dynasties, Choya, Chera, Pandya. Choyas, Cheras and Pandyas, three types of dynasties. Pandyas were ruling from and around Madurai. Earlier, they were in Korkai. Then later they moved to Madurai. Korkai is somewhere near Tutukudi today or the Chutukudi port where the Kail port and things like that were there in good old days. Under the Pandya kings, the Sangam age flourished. Sangam age is the Sangam means coming together of the persons, confluence of the literate people, the poets, the writers, the learned men. It's a Sangam, the coming together, the confluence. And so Madurai was a great center of culture. Madurai was a great center of culture. Madurai was a capital of the Pandyas later. Earlier, Korkai was the capital. They were known for pearl fisheries and they were known to promote a trade through Kayal port. Now, poets and writers of Tamil language gathered at Sangam. They developed or grew or enhanced the stature of Tamil as a language. That is why the classics came up during that period. Now, Pandyas re-established in South Tamil Nadu by the end of 6th century. After eliminating Kalabras. But Cholas ruled South India from 9th to 13th century. So, from 6th century to 9th century, 600 to 900, we can say 700 to 900 or 1000, Pandyas were ruling the southern portion of Tamil Nadu. But Cholas regained, and from 9th century to 13th century, South India was under the control of the 
Cholas. That is why Cholas, Cheras and Pandyas are considered to be the three major dynasties of the rule in southern India, southern part of the peninsula. <coughs> Pandyas, there was one famous Pandya called Kadungkon. He recovered the Pandya territory from the Kalabras during the close of 6th century. Right? Who were they? <coughs> so, he was a Kadungkon. He was a very tough ruler. He is also known for some negative aspects also. Possibly, he is known to be the Pandyan king who killed lots of Jains. So, there is a story that a Pandyan king had a minister who was a Saivite saint called Tirinyana Sammandar. And this Saivite saint Tirinyana Sammandar converted the Pandyan king from Jain religion to Saiva, a follower of Shiva religion. So, when he got converted, Arikesari is the name of that king. Arikesari is the lion. And Ari is very um, scarce. So, this scarce type of red lion, type of name was given to him, Ari Kesari. So, from Jainism to Saivism, when he got converted, naturally, he will have anger towards his old religion. So, he became anti-Jain. His attitude grew wilder. And he is said to have killed hundreds of Jains. That is why he was given a name Koon Pandyan. Koon is to kill or to make blood fill. So, blood fall. He caused a blood fall. So, he was called Kun Pandyan. That is one belief. right? He is a Arikesari Maravarman. He is also called Kodungon. The specialty is that he was able to run a military campaign and win from Kalabras the certain territory and bring it back onto Pandya's control. The rule of the Pandya kingdom or the extent of the Pandya kingdom from 6th to 9th century expanded because of this Kadungkon Arikesari Maravarman's capabilities. He came to throne in 642. So, we are studying medieval history which is 700 to 1750. He also won wars against Cholas, Sharas, Pallavas and Sinhalese. When we say Sinhalese, we mean the Pandyan naval expedition went to Sri Lanka, Ceylon. The Pallavas were ruling on the northern part of Tamil Nadu, that is the Kanjipuram area. Cholas were ruling the Tamil Delta area, the Uriur, Tanjavur, Tirichi area. Cholas were ruling the western part of the peninsula. Kadungko Narikesari Maravarman ascended the throne in 642 and was able to expand the Pandyan kingdom and bring it back to his glorious past. Then came Jatilan Nudinjadayan. Nudinjadayan was also called Varguna one. So, Nidinjadayan ruled from 756 to 815. Nidinjadayan ruled from 756 to 815. He expanded the Pandya kingdom. What did he do? He went up to Tanjavur and captured the Cholas. He captured the Trichurapalli from the Cholas. He brought Salem and Coimbatore under his control. The Coimbatore area and all was under the Chera control. Then, Srimara Srivallabha was the next king after the Nidinjadayan. And then we have a king, Varaguna 2. Varaguna 1 and Varaguna 2. Varaguna II successfully defeated the Pallavas. Successfully defeated the Pallavas. So, that is how the Tanjavur Tirichi of the Chola region or the Coimbatore of the Chela, um, Cheras or the uh, Pallavas were brought under the Pandya rule. So, between 642 when Arikesari Maravarman came to power till that time Varguna II. Varguna II came after uh, Nidinjadayan was there up to 815. After that, the Varguna II came. So, the Pallava region, the Chola region, the Tirichi Tanjavur region, the Chera region, everything came under the Pandya kingdom when it is by around 815. Then we have Parantaka 1. Chola king defeated the Pandya king Rajasimha 2 in 920. So, what happened? The Pandya kingdom kept expanding and then you had a Chola king who defeated the Pandya king in 920. That means what? In 920, the fall of Pandya Empire started and the rise of the Chola Empire started in 920. That is why we say from 9th to 13th century, it was the golden period for the Chola dynasty while 7th to 9th century, the Pandya dynasty ruled the Tamil Nadu areas. The rise of the Pandyas. Subsequently, later Pandyas raised. These are called the later Pandyas. The early Pandyas were ruling from 6th to 9th century, 920 they lost. Then in 11, 10, they came back. We say 9 to 11, 9 to 13, 
the cholas were ruling but in 11 itself they started coming back how the chola viceroyalty viceroyalty means a viceroy was appointed a governor was appointed to rule the the viceroyalty came weak in the pandya country after that of adi rajendra the last king of the vijayalaya line we saw when we studied about history that adi rajendra after adi rajendra the um chola kingdom started falling apart right the pandya kingdom emerged as the only leading tamil dynasty after that period so they started as the leading tamil dynasty marco polo came then marco polo wrote a lot about the pandya kingdom that means what he wrote more about pandya kingdom than others means pandya kingdom were having their glorious period at that time he was a traveler from venice from marco polo we learn so many other things also ibn batuwa talks to us about the moment between the gulags activities like this marco polo says the kail port was busy with ships ships were full and ships were from arabia and china so we know a lot of trade was happening kail port was very busy we know people from arabia and china did the trade in the kail port with the pandyas he visited two times marco polo visited the pandya kingdom two times 1288 and 1293 28 and 293 he visited two times and he said the kail port continues to be bustling with business that means what for a long time the port was the major center of trade in the pandyan kingdom then he hailed the pandyas for what for being the richest and the most splendid province that is why they were able to run the sangams that is why they were known for the gems and pearls that they were selling the gems were the navaratans dug out while the pearls were got by fishing on the kail port he also recorded that sati and polygamy were present in the tamil kingdoms marco polo recorded that sati and polygamy were present in the southern kingdoms in those periods 1288 1293 when he visited the area now <clears throat> we have a king called sadaya varman or jada varman and this jada varman was also called sundara pandian sadaya varman jada varman jadai or sadai and then you hold a sundara pandian was his actual name he ruled from 1251 to 1268 1251 to 1268 sundara pandian he brought the entire tamil nadu under his rule even the andhra or the nellu region andhra or the nellu region where the chalukyas were there he subdued the malanadu malanadu is where the cheras were ruling and then hoysala hoysalas were ruling in the today's karnataka region northwest of tamil nadu this is northeast of tamil nadu sadaya varman or jada varman or saundara pandian who ruled from 1251 to 1268 is a pandian king who brought the andhra nellu region the telugu cholas the malanadu cheras the hoysalas of the northwest under the pandian rule that means the pandian kingdom was all over southern india he defeated the boja king of malwa region which is a central india and veera someshwara at kannanur so he did a expedition to the north also up to malwa he did go he had authority over chieftains of kadalur in kanjiburam and arcot and selam so sundara pandian jadavarman sadeyavarman of 1251 1268 period brought under his control andro nellur malanadu hoysalas malwa kadalur arcot kanjiburam selam etc after him his son vikrama pandian and his son veera pandian they ruled now they were ruling also as a co regent co regent means what simultaneously ruling different parts but the same kingdom and same rules and same dynasty after that the rivalry also happened and then subsequently they lost also that's a different story after sundara pandian maravaram kolasegaran ruled for a period of 40 years now we know sundara pandian ruled from 51 to 68 which is only a less than 20 years 50 to 70 is 20 years it is than 20 years then for 40 years kolasegaran ruled there was a time of peace and prosperity because he was not doing any expansion like with this it was a time of peace and prosperity sundara pandian killed his father kolasegaran opposing his brother veera pandian this means what vikrama pandian veera pandian were co regents and then when <coughs> kolasegaran had to die because after his death 
these people were not willing to work as co-regents or governors so they had to enter into a civil war and after that civil war veera pandian had won the war and became the ruler sundara pandian killed his father kulashegaran opposing his brother veera pandian so we had veera pandian vikrama pandian sundara pandian's grandson is also sundara pandian because sundara pandian's son kulasegaran was ruling kulasegaran's son were sundara pandian veera pandian and vikrama pandian so sundara pandian killed his father kulasegaran there was a civil war in which veera pandian won and sundara pandian was driven out where did sundara pandian go sundara pandian fled and took refuge under alauddin khalji sundara pandian went and took refuge under alauddin khalji when he went under alauddin khalji there was a scope for alauddin khalji to know about the southern kingdoms that is why malik kafur came up to the pandian kingdom in 1310 and then madurai became a muslim state subordinate of the delhi sultan in 1310 malik kafur could come because sundara pandian went and took refuge under alauddin khalji Veera Pandian and Vikrama Pandian were ru- ruling as co-regents. Veera Pandian won the civil war. Veera Pandian won the civil war which was caused by Sundara Pandian's killing of his father Kulasegaran. Kulasegaran is son of Sundara Pandian. Sundara Pandian is the one who expanded the Pandian empire all over and he ruled from 1251 to 1268. But by 1310 Malik Kafur of Alauddin Khalji's general came and made Madurai his subordinate. what is the polity in the pandian kingdom madurai has been popularly venerated as a koodal koodal kon koodal nagar kaval and these were the names given to the king koodal is a place so you have kayal you have koodal you have kurkai <coughs> arab cultural and commercial ties were there which provided horses to provide an edge to the army so horses came first to the pandian army and only then chara chola army got the horses they claimed rule as per manu shastra they had a social hierarchy brahmin settlements were called mangalams mangalams were also divisions in chola dynasty they were also called chaturvedi mangalam chaturvedi means four vedas actual land owning groups are described as bhumi putrar sons of the soil bhumi putrar they were also called velalar people who do velan my agriculture people who had land were called velalar velan vagai land they were called natu makkal natu makkal means people of the nadu what is nadu we had nadu nagaram ur mangalam etc right so natu makkal the communal assembly of the group was called chitrameli periyanata chitrameli periyanata periyanata is the the, um, the big people the elders of the nadu nata is the um, nobles of the nadu so the elders the people who were decision makers the influencers the periyanata chitrameli periyanata are the people who used to rule in chola dynasty also we have seen urar sabayar nata nagaratar and all so here you have nato makkal velalar bhumi putrar chitrameli periyanata has the social state of affairs the social strata the royal officials the royal officials were there to execute the royal orders they had a big band wagon of officials in pandian kingdom respected officials were called as maranenan satan ganapati ennathi satan tirathiran murthi ainan etc the prime minister was the uttara mantra mantra mantri is the minister uttara is the special or a superior minister uttara mantri manika vasagar was a minister kulachirayar was a famous minister manika vasagar was also a saint the titles of the military commanders were also given according to their winnings elsewhere palli velan parantagan palli velan maran adityan tennaven tamil vel like that titles were given all these things we come to know from the inscriptions which talk about the victories that people did or the good things that these people did royal secretariat was known as yejuttu mandabam yejuttu means right yejuttu mandabam is where they write the rules or the orders or the policies and principles so yejuttu mandabam administration pandian nadu consisted of many provinces the provinces of cholas were called mangalams here it was called vela nadu vala nadu vala nadu valam is um wealth got from the prosperity of the soil fertility of the soil valam is prosperity or fertility valam 
So, Pandi Nadu consists of many provinces known as Valanad, divided into Nadus and Kurrams. In Chola administration also, we saw that Ur, Nadu, Kurram, um, etc. was there. They contained settlements. Nadu or the Kuram contained settlements. Kuram is a group of village and Ur was a small village. Now, what is the settlement? Mangalam was a province. Nagaram was a city or a town. Ur was a village. Kudi was a small settlement, smaller than Ur. Group of Urs or Kudi can become a Kuram. Groups of Kuram will become a Nadu. Groups of Nadu will become a Vala Nadu. So, likewise, administration was divided for convenience. Inscription from Manur and Tarnilveli says it is dated 18, 800. 800 means what? It is very old, before all these people came. The inscription says, Village assemblies and committees looked into the governance of the Pandya kingdom. Village assemblies and committees looked into the governance of Pandya kingdom. Though king was on the top, on the local level you had assembly or committee or a group of people. Civil and military power were many times rested on the same person. So like we have the Yikta, Yikta Dar Muktis, the civil and military power was with the same person. The same person will say how much revenue you have to pay. The same person will decide on the dispute. Same person will collect the revenue. Same person will raise the army and he will be the landowner also. And he will supply the revenue and armed support to the government. So civil and military powers were with the same person. Irrigation. Number of irrigation sources were created in Pandya kingdom. In Chola kingdom, we saw how the crisscross Vadi Vaikal was there. In Pandya kingdom, on the side of rivers of Vaigai and Tamirabarani, Tamirabarani is in Ternelivili, Tutukudi district, while Vaigai is in Madurai district. On either side, channels were dug leading to irrigation tank to capture the flood water and store for future. Channels were dug so that the water that overflows in the river will be captured by the channels on either side to be taken to the tanks for storage. Storage tanks were there. So storage works were called Kamma, Kanmai. It was called Kamma. Then irrigation works were done by local administrative bodies. Building or managing the river or the well or the pond exiting etc. were the responsibility of the local administrative body, local chiefs. Local bodies were maintenance and repair also responsible for. Traders sponsored digging of the tanks for irrigation. Traders were sponsoring because of the philanthropical works. When they become rich, they give back to society. Religion. Pandya's extended patronage to the Vedic practices. Velvikudi. Velvikudi is a place. From there, we got copper plate. Copper plate inscription tells us they knew how to use copper. They were writing in the copper and copper plates were meant for long term information. Where we could a copper plate tells us what? It tells that rituals like Ashwamedha, Hiranyagarbha, Vajapeya were done by the Pandya king. So if where we could a copper plates says that the Vedic rituals, Vedic rituals like Ashwamedha, Hiranyagarbha were done by the kings, that means that the Pandya king were more supportive of the Vedic religious practices. But at the same time, they were impartial to Saivism and Vaishnavism. That means what? They did not prefer one religion over another for a long time. They were impartial. So they allowed all sex to SECT to flourish. At the same time, we also have a story of the Kun Pandyan who is supposed to have killed a lot of Jains when we converted. Now, the Pandyans also patronized temples. They patronized by giving land for raising the revenue as well as by giving tax exemption and funding for renovation. The Saiva Vaishnava sect, the Saiva Vaishnava saint, Nayanmars are the followers of Shiva, Alvar are the followers of Vishnu. So, this is Vishnu, this is Shiva. These are the to Saivism and Vaishnavism, branches of Hinduism in those days, they contributed together for the growth of Tamil literature and spiritual enlightenment. The Sangam also helped. They promoted Tamil and they promoted Sanskrit. There were seasons of religious conflict. Why? Because the Bhakti movement had started creeping in. What is Bhakti movement? You don't have to follow one big Shaiva sect or a Vaishnavism or a big god, you can have your own personal small god in your mind and create your own personal religious belief. That is Bhakti movement. The god or the religion is not something big outside, but something inside and close to you, personal to you. This is Bhakti movement. This prompted the scholars for a debate. And the debate many times the Buddhist and Jains lost. 
and when they lost then the king will shun that religion and take up their religion that has won and so these were persecuted this also happened at different points in time because of the bhakti movement but velvikudi copper plate says kings were supportive of the vedic practices temples the pandyas did not bring any great temples but they expanded existing temples they were building gopuras and mandapas if you look at the madurai meenakshi amman temple the madurai meenakshi amman temple grew larger and wider under each of the pandya king the additional gopuras will built or mandapas were built mandapas means hall gopura means tower gopuram mandapam mandapam is a hall and gopuram is a tower the monolithic mega size ornamented pillar is a main feature monolithic mega size ornamented pillar is the gopuram many times it is made of seen many many idols there are made of single stones it is a unique feature sculptures of shiva vishnu kotravai kotravai is a goddess of korkai ganesha subramanya were seen in these places they patronize a historic meenakshi temple when we say it kept expanding when we say they built gopuras and mandapas what happened is around the meenakshi amman temple if you see there will be four roads which is the rectangular or a square settlement that we study in geography after that on each of that road there will be further parts and parcels of the gopurams and mandapams built for expansion of the madurai temple as population expanded as trade flourished as peasants started coming and settling here as the kingdom expanded trade trade in pandya kingdom is very popular because they had the kail port we knew the arabs had were selling horses now we also know from marco polo and from wasaf another traveler british traveler that the kings invested in horses now horses were called kudirais and the people traders who were selling kudirai or who were dealing in kudirai were called kudirai chetti because chettiyar is one type of trading community so kudirai chettis were dealing in horses wasaf and marco polo told us from their inscriptions from their runicles that they was the kings were interested in horse trade at one point in time there were 10000 horses imported into kayal and other ports because there were ports in western coast also the chera or the malanadu were under the control of the pandyas so there were 1400 of them were from jamaluddin himself jamaluddin is an arabic trader who was dealing in trade his own breed was sold 1400 of them out of the 10000 that was imported and jamaluddin what was he famous for other than the horse breed and horse trader he had his own agents in kail port fell selling the horses jamaluddin had his own agent in the kail port what else we know from marco polo we know that each horse cost on an average 2200 dinars of red gold 2200 dinars of red gold was a cost on an average for each of the horse 10000 horses were imported jamaluddin's own brand some 1400 from a single trader so this tells us how trade was happening this also tells us gold coins were in uh, circulation the coin was called kasu kalanju or pun pun means gold kasu means money the coins were called kasu kalanju or pun gold coins were in circulation and it was also used to pay for the imports now arab settlements were more on the west coast from the 7th century onwards they were doing trade so the malanadu or the chera rule were encouraging the arab settlements that is why we have anju vannathar in the chola king the governments of the east coast pursued a more liberal and enlightened policy so the arab settlements on the west coast started doing more trade with the eastern part of the peninsula overseas traders were coming to the eastern side to the kail port also they were given charters or that means the decree by the government saying what exempting from certain taxes or duties in the port certain tolls certain kappam certain taxes so arab chieftain malikul usman jamaluddin malikul usman jamaluddin established an agency malikul usman sir established an agency in kail port he supplied horses so if you have to establish an agency one trader has to do it then he should be knowing that so much trade is possible through this port because the kings are willing to patronize so this is about the pandyan kingdom now here you find tondai nadu arava nadu kolli malai neelagiri sita nadu konkanam kanam was another type of division of land kanam nadu punnadu kongnadu 
Panjinadu, Korabur, Urayur, Urayur is where the Chola dynasty started and they expanded and they went up to Tanjavur. You have Punna Nadu. So Pandyas were ruling this area, Cholas were ruling this area, and the Cheras were ruling the Malanadu. So this Venad, even today, some portion of southern Kerala will be called as Venad. So this is Puyinadu. Parsi was here. Parsi was a king. First king of Kerala who fought against the British, Parashi Raja, Parashi Nadu. So this is how the southern part of Tamil Nadu were ruled by Cholas, Cheras and Pandyas. These were the Modipayar Desam, Modipayar Desam, the Hoysalas were here, the Telugu Cholas were here, here the father. This is the Kasargodu. From Kasargodu today, the Karnataka starts up to Kasargodu, it is Kerala and then you have Karnataka from here, the Hoysala Raja. So this is how the, we study about the Pandyas and the Cholas, the new kingdoms of southern India in the medieval Indian history.